Everyone, here are the excerpts from the Rule of Saint Benedict for uh, May 31st and June 1st. I actually forgot to read May 31st, so I will be combining that with today's reading. And also, I forgot to let you know in the unbagging yesterday that I got a prayer card with this prayer. Um, prayer card of St. Benedict with this prayer on it, so we will be starting these videos with this prayer. <clears throat> Sancte Pater Benedicte per exemplarem vitam tuam et pretio, pretiosissimam mortem tuam benedict me in via regule tue ut perve, perveniam Ad patriam eternae gloriae in celis. Amen. O Holy Father Benedict, by thy, exemplary, by thy exemplary life and most precious death, bless me in the path of thy holy rule, that I may arrive at the country of eternal glory in heaven. Amen. <clears throat> now to find the excerpts. All right. Here we are. Secundus humilitatis gradus est, si, propitia, si propriam, quis non amans voluntatem desideria sua non delectetur implar, implere. Sed vocem ilam domini factis imitetur dicentis, non veni facere voluntatem meam, sed eus Qui me misit, item dicit scriptura, voluptas habet penam et necessitas parit co coronam. The second degree of humility is that a man love not his own will, nor delight in fulfilling his own desires, but carry out, indeed, the saying of the Lord. I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It is written also, self-will has its punishment, but necessity winneth a crown. Tertius humilitatis gradus est, ut, quid, ut quis pro dei amore omni obediencia se subdat maiori imitans dominum De quodicit apostolus, factus obediens usque ad mortem. The third degree of humility is that a man, for the love of God, subject himself to his superior in all obedience, imitating the Lord of whom the apostle says, He was made obedient even unto death. I also have the Benedictine, the commentary geared towards Benedictine oblates on Kindle, so I will read that as well. So I will only read the one for June 1st, so. So. All right, so there we are. So it has a commentary and an application. <coughs> hmm. So these videos will now take the format of the reading from the rule. This is McCann, Justin McCann's translation which is not used in this um but i will use the commentary from this in uh conjunction with abbot mccann's translation so in the second degree of humor this is the commentary by the way commentary in the second degree of humility there was question in a general way of the necessity 
necessary conformity of our will to God. But the divine will may manifest itself in various ways, not only through the commandments of God and of the church, but also through the rules of ecclesiastical discipline, through the duties of our state, through our rules and our particular regulations, it may manifest itself also through the positive orders of superiors. It is in this last case that it often requires the most abnegation on the part of our human nature. The fact is that even faith, even if faith shows us Christ in the person of the superior, a certain latent naturalism murmurs to us that after all, this superior is only an equal, and that perhaps, at least we are tempted to think so, he understands things less well than we and is inferior to us in virtue. Now perfection, according to the third degree of humility, consists in listening only to faith and submitting ourselves totally. Omni obedientia to this form of authority. This is what the monk does by his vow of obedience. In obeying his abbot totally, he will follow Christ totally. To be sure, the superior is fallible, but as far as, but as for the subject, he knows that he makes no mistake in obeying, unless of course, in the case envisioned elsewhere by St. Benedict, in which the order given would be contrary to the law of God, to justice or to charity, something which can only be very exceptional, but to be, but to be such as our Holy Father desires, this obedience must not be purely exterior, it must come from the, it must come from the inmost soul. It must be inspired by love of the Lord, pro Dei amore. And to that love, one should arouse oneself by considering Christ, who was truly obedient unto death. His entire life says, his entire life, says Dom Lore, was indeed a continual act of obedience. Here's a footnote. And that was said in commentar, uh, page 122. So you can check that out. Obedience, uh, sorry guys, I am lost. Was indeed a continual act of obedience. Obedience to his heavenly father, obedience to Mary, his mother, Obedience in the most humble labours to his foster father, St. Joseph. Being creator, he obeyed his creatures. And in his passion, when he said the loving and sorrow, sorrowful fiat, obedience led him to death. He remained immobile under the bufferings and the stripes. He has accepted the crown of thorns. He stretches himself out on the cross to be nailed there. He is there until death follows. It is thus that Christ made himself obedient unto death and to the death of the cross. There's another footnote. Uh, Don Bernard Marichaud, uh, Saint Benoit, Xavier, Sarregle, uh, Sa doc Doctrine Spiritual, page 154. So, <clears throat> here's the interesting part of this commentary, the application. The commentators observe that the complete practice of this degree can be realized only by the religious who in virtue of his vow abdicates his will without reserve into the hands of the superior the question, then, is to know what we oblates can instill into our lives of the practice of this degree. 
if the vow of obedience is not the portion of every Christian, on the other hand, the virtue of obedience which the vow has the purpose of safeguarding and strengthening is imposed on all. There is for every Christian, says Dom Marisho. Ibid, page 152, so there's a lot of footnotes in this. Anyways. A way of making his will give away before God, to observe the commandments to their full extent, and to obey the voice of the church. More than that, by the fact of living in society, the Christian finds himself concerned. First, with natural superiors, the child must obey its parents. The wife, her husband, the man himself must obey the lawful authorities, and from this there results the compulsory fulfilment of the duties of one state. Then there's two more footnotes in this. Let's see, footnote 123, Ibid, page 199. Let us add that in the Christian family, by virtue of the sacraments of matrimony, Ooh. 124, the sacrament of matrimony establishes the Christian family on a supernatural place, plane and makes it, it a spiritual community. This is perhaps one of the most important and most neglected points of the Catholic doctrine on the family. Interesting footnotes here. Anyways. On which it is founded and in virtue also of the fact that each member of the family is a baptized person, authority and subordination take on a character which is necessarily supernatural. Thank you for listening to support me further. Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't see. There was more. Anyways. A step higher. There are the spiritual superiors. The Christian must submit to the heads of the church in all that is in the domain of conscience. This subjection, says Dom Marichaud, Marichaud, is, dispense, is indispensable for every Christian in order to accomplish God's will. Now, let's see where he says it. Uh, Benoit Xavier Sardregle, Sardregle. So, Doctrine Spiritual, that's the book that was just mentioned. And yet, there, is, there still remains some play to the very will so meritoriously subjected. Ibid, page 152. The Oblate who wishes to approach monastic perfection as nearly as possible should ask himself, therefore, if there is still room to restrain what freedom is left to him. For the priest of late, that restriction goes without saying. By the practice of continence, he has entered, like the monk, into the way of the councils. Moreover, he has promised obedience to his bishop, and the authority which the bishop possesses over him much more personal and much more precise than the authority the bishop has over the rest of the faithful, brings serious limit to that freedom which remains to him. But what is he to do for that remaining part, and what shall the lay oblate do? We have already spoken of this in the explanation of the chapter on obedience. Let him be, f let him have first of all the cult of obedience, but of obedience enlightened by the spirit of faith, let him have the desire to obey, demanded by our Holy Father when he says of his children, Abatem sibi prese desiderant, desiderant. They desire that an abbot be over them, which is in chapter 5. And let, 
and then let him apply this spirit in the practice of his rule as approved by his directors. There are so many decisions that we can put into the hands of those who direct us, not only as the economy of our days, but as to our works of zeal, our practice and modification our practices of modification, our intellectual labours and so forth. Finally, let the Oblate not forget that he cannot be a perfect son of St. Benedict without being a perfect parishioner. The role of the Oblate, wrote the right Reverend Abbot of Salems, is in the framework of their respective parishes to be models of Christian life by zeal for their churches and by participation in parochial activities. Bouton de Saint Martin de Saint Benoit, March 1929, page 90. From the fact that he does not actually dwell in the monastery, the oblate finds himself a member of a parochial community. Then again, he will have to do a work of obedience, sometimes with a great deal of abnegation when the oblate will remember what the oblate will remember above all in this manifold practice of obedience are those two short formulas of saint benedict which give the whole which give the whole meaning to the third degree of humility pro dei amore for love of god Imitans Dominum, in imitation of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. To support me further, please like, share, subscribe, comment, and God bless. Thank you.